we're trying to preserve telehealth coverage. Patients and caregivers are benefiting from remote visits in many ways, and these are just a few examples. Telehealth improves access to care and increases patient safety, especially in this era of COVID-19. It's convenient and comfortable. It eliminates travel time and reduces costs and time away from work and family. And for our population of patients with chronic diseases, mobility problems and other disabilities, and those who live in remote locations, telehealth is more than a choice, it's a necessity. So after this um, town hall, we ask you to visit aan.com slash telehealth to learn more. So I, it is my privilege to introduce Representative Mikey Sherrill. She represents New Jersey's 11th district located in Northern New Jersey. She was first elected in 2018. She's a former Navy pilot. Uh, and we discussed a little bit of that before we started this uh, town hall. She's a former prosecutor, mother of four. And this is only a glimpse of her incredibly impressive resume. Uh, I, I looked her up beforehand, wow, is all I can say. And she's now become an emerging leader in telehealth, which is why she was invited today. She's the lead sponsor of the Protect Telehealth Access Act. And this addresses two big barriers to successful telehealth implementation, basically about site of service. It removes requirements that people receiving telehealth services must be in rural or health professional shortage areas, and it better enables people to receive telehealth services at home. She's also co-leading legislation to study the impacts of telehealth during the public health emergency, and we thank you very much, Representative Cheryl, for working on these issues. So before we talk about telehealth, could you share with us a little bit about yourself and what inspired you to run for Congress? Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is um, an issue that uh, has gained so, gained so much predominance in this crisis, but I think we've learned from this how important uh, telehealth can be to so many of our citizens. I uh, ran for Congress. In, I started running in 2017 for the 2018 election cycle, and and really, it was after a lifetime of, of serving in government positions and military positions, I left. Uh, went to the Naval Academy when I was 18 years old. Um, I wanted to be a pilot like my grandfather who flew in World War II. He flew B-24s, as I mentioned, and was actually shot down over occupied France and rescued by the Free French. Um, so I wanted to follow in his footsteps and continue that service and um, flew helicopters in the Navy for almost 10 years. When I got out, I went to law school and then went back into service uh, at the U.S. Attorney's Office. I worked on helping people who were coming out of federal prison successfully re-enter their communities, our community in North Jersey, and, um, and then was a federal prosecutor. And I, I found I was attracted to the criminal justice reform efforts that were going on and felt like there was more work that needed to be done. I had anticipated I would do that, uh, but then after the 2016 elections, felt like I could uh, be of most help running for Congress in my district, um, which is uh, what I did. And so now I'm serving, as, as you mentioned, I was uh, sworn in in 2019, January of 2019, after the 2018 election. So this is my freshman year in Congress. That's fantastic. So uh, tell us about your interest in telehealth and about the legislation that you're leading. So, you know, just as on a, a personal level, I can't tell you how many times as a, a working mom, um, and my husband works in, and he works in the city, and it, we're in North Jersey, so he commutes to New York City on a train. So generally, getting my kids and myself to and from different doctor's appointments um, is really kind of falls in my lap. So just trying to get home from work early to get your kids there or um, trying to figure out an appointment time when what would really has been kind of eye-opening, quite frankly, during this crisis as we've opened up telehealth, as so many of my doctors in my region have opened up telehealth, is how many appointments um, can be made using this and how convenient it is, especially when so many of us have smartphones and can, can get on a video conference, although we've even seen really how important it is to people that don't have access and that, that have to do it on the telephone. But that, that is just, quite frankly, for, for working moms and dads all over, you know, it can be a real boon. But then there are the people where it's a necessity. And I think you mentioned some of that, people that have mobility problems that get 
thing to and from the doctor's office is incredibly difficult. Um, and not just that, in a time of a pandemic like this, really dangerous if you have co-occurring conditions and you don't need to go into the doctor's office for a visit. Uh, this has become such a, such, you know, a much safer, and I think a lot of people feel much more comfortable doing this, especially if you have a long-term condition, where, which requires a lot of check-ins, a lot of appointments, a lot of discussions with your doctor. So um, I have, uh, I, I will tell you, um, just from my personal experience, there have been several times during coronavirus where my family and I have used telehealth incredibly successfully, but also just what I'm hearing around the district and, and what a need this fulfills for people, not just during the pandemic, but but just in general and, and how important it is that we continue this. And, and, and I feel very strongly um, that we've got to continue the ability for people to receive um, doctor services through telehealth after the pandemic is well. So I have two uh, related questions. One, when I first started in the telehealth space, um, I remember attending lectures from uh, people in the military who were deployed and uh, they were using um, the, 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 the frontline hospitals or whatever the correct term is, needed expertise that was available somewhere else. And so they, they, basically pioneered a lot of telehealth, especially with surgery and, of course, acute care and injuries. I wonder if you had any personal uh, experience uh, when you were in the Navy with the Navy's implementation of telehealth and how that informs uh, uh, your, your bill. So I didn't personally have um, an experience with telehealth. Sorry, I just kicked my um, when I was in the Navy. But I will tell you, you can see how critical it is to our military services when you're forward deployed, um, when people can't easily get to and from home, uh, and you have your doctors who really need the advice of telehealth. So um, I do know it was critical to, to some of our, our military service members as we were serving overseas and in remote duty stations. I, I never personally took, took advantage of it, but I think you're exactly right. That, that's where a lot of it was pioneered. Yeah, and the other thing is, the, 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 other, the other pioneer uh, related to the military is the VA. Uh, and um, I'm at NYU now and we had to say, well, you know, uh, what kind of licenses do we need in New Jersey? By the way, your state is extremely permissive. I got my license in a half an hour, a temporary telemedicine license, which is great. Some, 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 is some states erect big barriers, some don't. But the thing about the VA is, it's my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if you have one medical license, you can practice in the VA system everywhere. That's not the way it is for us civilians. And so it's very easy to set up a national network in the VA, stroke and things like that. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about uh, the VA and telehealth. Well, I don't have, uh, I, I didn't know that background that you were just discussing, um, but I do have a lot of thoughts about the VA and telehealth because as you know, um, some of our VA centers serve a broad geographic range. And it can be very hard for people to get to and from. And in fact, sometimes, um, people go to uh, areas where they can take a bus out to the VA system. So some sort of routine checkup can take all day for somebody to go get the bus and then be transported out and then have their doctor's visit and then wait for the bus and then be transported back. So this is an area where um, I think it could just really improve the quality of life for so many of our veterans, if they didn't have to always go into the doctor's appointment, if there were appointments that they could have, check-ins that they could have, um, that where they didn't have to go in. We also know that a lot of our veterans um, miss many appointments uh, for in different areas, especially in the areas of mental health. And so I've, I've had a bill to make sure um, some of our veterans have childcare, but some of it is just time and access to uh, the mental health experts. So to the extent that some of, we could make it easier for our veterans to access that treatment, I think that could be a real boon to them as well. Yeah, I think that um, the less you have to physically touch the patient, the, the better telehealth is. And so mental health is a natural for this. Uh, and, uh, uh, and there are some aspects of neurology, for example, pain or places where you don't have to do a detailed exam, it, it fits better too. Um, you know, telehealth has lots of moving parts, and I'm just curious, 
uh, before we move on to some other topics, why you pick these two particular subjects, the, you know, the site of service as, as, as the keystones of your bill? Well, um, as you know, a lot of times you know, telehealth has been reserved for areas where there are more rural areas. We don't, um, you know, and we put certain provisions in place. And in New Jersey, quite frankly, we're a very densely populated state. Um, we don't have as many rural areas as, as many of our states, and yet we still have this critical need for telehealth services. We do have a lot of people that find it difficult to get to services. So, so that, that really made sense. And, and a lot of it was just hearing from constituents and hearing from our, our health care providers about what was needed in the district and, and kind of the the holes in the telehealth legislation and where I could be helpful. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, in New York City, uh, it's not distance, it's time. So my kids and grandkids are in Brooklyn. It's a few miles away, but it's a long commute. And to schlep some kids somewhere is amazing, right? And we have a lot of people at NYU from Staten Island, and it doesn't sound real easy to get from Staten Island to uh, 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 NYU unless you were on a helicopter, I suppose. Uh, exactly. I don't think people realize. I lived on the Upper West Side for a while, and I don't think people realize that you're exactly right. Just going a couple miles can can take a, a bit of time to get around the city. So um, you're right. It's not distance. It's it's really um, how people get around and, and how difficult it might be in some areas to get around. Now, what, I guess one final question before we move on to broader issues of telehealth. Um, so, you know, we've been discussing telehealth for a while, and for a long time, the scientific evidence uh, was the rate determining step, and it was, it was to say that telehealth is as good as in-person health. And then some of us were talking, we realized there are actually situations, and your bill speaks to this, where actually it's better because you can see the patient in their home. And so if you have a patient with a mobility issue, it sort of doesn't matter what they look like in my office. It matters, can they get up their stairs? Can they get out of their couch? Can they cook their, their, their meals? And so our rehab people say that a virtual home visit is actually superior to and an evaluation in an office. And so your bill speaks to a really big need. Uh, you can learn a lot more sometimes about people from seeing them in their home with their family dynamics and the physical environment than you can in an office setting. And so, so it's sort of back to the future. You know, in, in the old days, well before uh, my time, there were home visits. And actually, this, this actually is an improvement over seeing someone in the office, not only for the travel and all that other business, but because you get to see them where they actually live. I think that is such a great point, and I'll, I'll just, uh, you know, in my own experience, um, my father-in-law lived in, in what, in my family, we call an upside-down house, where the kitchen and living area were on the second floor, and some of the bedrooms were on the, the lower floor. And it, you know, he was having a lot of trouble with stairs. And if you didn't realize that, if you, if you, if you didn't know that as his care provider, that you know he was a little bit housebound for a while um, because he couldn't leave that floor. Um, he couldn't get he couldn't do the stairs if he was alone. And and if you didn't realize that, um, and if he didn't have family around, it would have been so instrumental in providing care to him to realize that he might be trapped in his home and what that might mean for uh, his mental health, for getting out, and 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 different things like that. And that's something that you never would have realized if he had come to you. Um, and so just in that one instance, that, that comes to mind so quickly. So I think you're exactly right in being able to sort of take stock of people in their homes and, and what the needs might be there to make sure they're, they're not just coming to you for medical advice, but sort of the, the whole person and how they're living and if that's impacting their health. Uh, I think that's a great insight. Yeah, that, that, that's actually a huge deal for, for a lot of our patients. So moving sort of more general uh, telehealth, what do you see as the key barriers to ensuring that we retain the advancements in telehealth that came on so, so rapidly? You know, every two weeks there was a new rule during the pandemic. So I think part of uh, the barriers have been this, this sense that it's going to cost more to provide telehealth. Um, and so I think what we have to show 
is how this has been um, this has been helpful and how we can keep the cost down. Um, so we have different people saying that this is going to to really not be you know not be as useful as 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 we've seen it is that it's going to cost more money. And yet, I think what we can show is that um, it really we really can keep costs down by telehealth if we do it right, and we won't see those cost advances. But we have to show the data and the evidence as we move forward. Uh, that, that's quite reasonable. So that, that leads into one of your other bills. I don't know whether you're ready to talk about it or not, but, but uh, you know, Seema Verma in a CMS blog said one of her three points was we have to study the, the fiscal impact of this. We do. And, and I think that's so important, too, because um, I really feel like telehealth is an idea that has, that has met its time. This is the time for it, right? We have the capabilities. We have the advancements. And, and just to tell you the truth, I'm sitting here on this, this call, and this is on my phone. I'm talking to all of you on the Zoom call, and I'm using my phone camera because, quite frankly, my phone camera is better uh, than my computer camera. So, right. so really, and this is how this is the phone I use, by the way, to do telehealth. I mean, this is really a time when um, just with the phones that we all carry, we can have these kind of telehealth conversations. And I think, um, in in some ways, the coronavirus pandemic has forced us to utilize technologies that we probably should have been using already to do some of the things that we're doing. We probably should have already made telehealth more widely available, especially to people with mobility problems. Um, but, but to a lot of people, even if you're having trouble getting from Staten Island to <laughs> Manhattan, you know, it, it, we just have so many opportunities here. But I think too, we, we also, as we're moving into these new areas, we do need the data. We need the evidence. We, meet, we need to make sure that, that sort of what we've seen so far and the benefits that we see truly are impacting people in a positive way. And, and so I think that's critical as well. Um, I, I don't think when it comes to people's health, we want to kind of go with our gut. We want to make sure that there's evidence-based research uh, that this truly is working for people and they're truly getting their health care needs met. I, I completely agree with you. You know, one of the reasons that telehealth wasn't studied extensively before because there wasn't much of it being done. And now, you know, we went from zero to Mach 3 uh, on March 19th at NYU and we were doing um, a thousand visits in neurology a week when we were doing literally zero except for a few stroke codes before then. And so we realized early on that this is a golden opportunity to study telehealth, and we have a bunch of studies. Some have been completed, some are in progress, and I'm sure other centers are doing the same thing to try to get the data while it's still easy to get because, you know, the faster you accumulate it, the faster you can make some decisions. Now, uh, uh, we've worked in the legislative and the regulatory space because they're complementary, and I wonder what thoughts you have about the interaction between Congress and CMS, the legislative and the regulatory side of telehealth and who has to do what first and in what order and things like that? Well, the way it works best is when Congress legislates uh, and then CMS understands the intent of Congress through the legislation and the hearings we've held and the findings that we have and then enacts it with the regulations, understanding um, the, the broad field and how the CMS regulations are going to best enact the intent of Congress. That doesn't always happen. We've had, you know, we, Congress, and, and I um, have been arguing with Treasury, for example, right now, and the and SBA and, and different groups because uh, some of the regulations they've put around the money we've been putting out during coronavirus don't meet with the intent of where we want the money to go, for example. So um, what what happens then is Congress re-legislates it and, and makes it more uh, specific as to how you have to do this. So I think what works best is when the agencies understand the intent of Congress and then carry out that intent with the best regulations possible. Sometimes the agencies, um, you know, I, they would disagree. I'm sure. I, sometimes the agencies get it wrong. Congress legislates and and they, they put out regulations that don't conform with that legislation. And then we have to go back and, like I said, then we have to detail how you should do it. I, I think it's best when sometimes these agencies detail how to do it because they understand um, better the field, but I think sometimes Congress does have to engage to push change 
uh, out when sometimes there's a little bit of resistance um, and maybe a little bit of inertia. Thanks, that's great. Uh, our audience is from all over the country. Uh, and are there any other members of Congress that you've been working with on telehealth who you'd like to highlight for our listeners? I would. I'd like to highlight the fact that this is this is a, a great bipartisan issue. We don't always see that now, and I think people are surprised to hear um, some of the bipartisan efforts that are still ongoing in Congress. So Representative Pern of Oklahoma, uh, who's a Republican, has been a great partner in this in the legislation and is very interested as well. Um, I've also joined, there's a telehealth caucus in Congress, a group of us who um, are very interested in promoting this and pushing this forward. Um, and I feel very lucky because um, the chairman of Energy and Commerce is in the New Jersey delegation, Chairman Pallone. And so I've been um, happy to advocate with him as well. And his staff has been great in talking through some of the issues. That's great. Uh, and what actions can neurologists and patients take to advocate telehealth that you think would be uh, most effective for us to do? I think, you know, sharing your experiences. So I, I talked a little bit about how important um, data and research is, but I think equally important are actual stories. That's very compelling to people about how it works on the ground. So you can have all the data in the world, but when you say, I had a patient, who is missing their appointments. And it turns out they were missing their appointments because they, they just didn't have access to transportation to get in. And they were getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And yet because of telehealth, because I was able to suddenly be in their living room, we were able to turn that around and get much better results. That's, that's really, I think, um, I think just the way the human brain works, and actually you would probably know a lot better than I do how the human brain works, but, but I think that just helps us um, on a, a deeper level, understand the need for some of this legislation. So not only is the research and development, but your advocacy and what you're seeing and why it's helping specifically and even specific patient stories. Um, that's very helpful, I think, talking to your Congress people and your senators um, and building the coalitions. And, and then please feel free to come to me and to my staff with policy ideas because, again, you know, we're passing these pieces of legislation to help in this area, and sometimes the legislation works perfectly, and sometimes it doesn't. So we're always interested, too, in making sure that whatever we're passing is most useful to people on the ground. That's superb. Well, we're getting to the end of our time. We have uh, two audience questions that I'd like to address before we wrap up. Uh, and the first one is, in my part of the country, broadband is not widely available, so I have to treat my patients by phone. Do you think Congress and CMS will continue to reimburse for telephone encounters, which they're doing now, as you know, and act to ensure that broadband connectivity is more widely available? So that's more of a disparities of health kind of issue. So um, I'll answer this, the second question first with broadband. This has become a national issue, um, something that I have advocated very strongly for many of my colleagues. I know it is in our infrastructure package, which is generally like a surface transportation package. Now we have broadband infrastructure that the House has passed. Um, and I'm hoping that we see movement on this in the Senate. I think we were aware, I, I know I have been aware and many members have been aware of the problems with broadband and how it's such a national issue. Certainly coronavirus and all of the ways that we're using the internet and video teleconferences and how children are receiving education has, has, I think, made it even more urgent that we act in this area. So I do see us moving forward on broadband, hopefully uh, in the near future. I know there's pieces that, of legislation that the House has already passed where we need the Senate to pass them. Um, and then as far as uh, will we, will we uh, move forward with, with tele, telephone calls, I, I think we have to, especially in some of our older and um, some of our poor communities who, who so desperately need access to health care and better health care and preventative health care, um, they don't always have the same access to um, internet, to broadband, um, to to video chats, et cetera. So I do think because of those disparities, until and unless we can address them, we do need to provide that access over um, the telephone as well. That was something we specifically addressed after I heard from some of my federally funded health centers that they really, you know, that they did as many 
video teleconferences as possible, but we worked on changing the regulations so they could be compensated for telephone um, conferences as well because of some of the access issues that we have. So I, I'm, I am happy to push forward too to make sure that that continues. That's uh, actually everything we wanted to hear about those two questions. So the final question um, sort of goes, circles back to the beginning. Uh, to us, using telehealth seems like t common sense. So what are the arguments against retaining the expansion? Is it something more than just money? Or is it just money? And how do we get around those uh, arguments? I, you know, the, the most I've heard is, is money. And, and, and I think we can disprove that argument with data. Um, but I do think that there are some concerns about making sure that people receive um, the type of healthcare they need, that we're not moving everything into telehealth because there are certain areas where you really need an in-person visit and you really need to, to be seen by a doctor. So um, I, I think there are some concerns around that, um, but I think, uh, I, I think again, this is an issue, you know, people, this, the time has come for this. The, we have the, the capability of doing good telehealth. And I also tend to think that um, there are going to be a lot of people like myself who have for the first time utilized telehealth during the pandemic and aren't going to want to go back. You know, I, I mean, if, you know, if, if somebody, one of my kids goes out in the sun and gets kind of a rash on their arm or something, um, sometimes the options are either you do telehealth or you just sort of go to the CVS and do what you can. You know, I think this is just a better level of healthcare for people to have a professional opinion on those things that are kind of borderline that you just, you know, if you, if it, if it doesn't get worse, you might just kind of ignore for a while because you're just so busy. Um, so I, I think it, we can really advocate strongly in this area. And I have to think that there are millions of Americans now who are going to be behind us in this effort. In terms of quality of care, I think that what we're realizing is that um, one of the types of telehealth is triage. So basically, if, if, if I see somebody on the camera and I say, I can't diagnose you, you must come in. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I recently broke my arm. They can't fix the fracture over the phone, okay? Yep, exactly. So you've been incredibly generous with your time. Uh, we've gone a few minutes over. Uh, I want to thank you again. Are there any final parting thoughts for the uh, audience out there? I think we're all going to move to New Jersey. I'm so impressed. I'm, I'm about ready to, you know. <laughs> That's very kind. Um, well, no, I just, I really appreciate your advocacy, your focus on this. I think it's important. Like I said, for for me, it's it's really a, a convenience issue just with being so busy and trying to get good health care for my family. But for so many Americans, it's a real issue of need. It, it really is difficult for so many people to get to and from the doctor's office. And this would provide a level of health care, I think, to, to people across the country that has been lacking. So I think it's a critically important issue for so many Americans. And I'm, I'm so thankful that you're pushing it and advocating for it. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for taking part. So that'll wrap up our uh, town hall. I hope that uh, uh, people learned a lot. I certainly learned a whole lot from talking to you, and I, I just can't thank you enough. Well, thank you, and have a great day. Thanks. Take care, folks.